Well, uh, anyway, my name is Phileas Daisley Guest, and um, it's my pleasure today to be moderating the summer this summer colloquium on ecological research with the Wolfram Language. This happens to be our second colloquium on ecological research, and today we're really fortunate to have with us two excellent speakers who've made notable use of Wolfram Language to advance our understanding of ecological systems. Our first speaker is Jonas Denk. Jonas was recently a postdoctoral researcher at the Halacek Lab at UC Berkeley, and he's currently a consultant with Zeb Consulting. The work he's, pre he's presenting today investigates the emergence of tipping points from weak mutualism in meta communities. We're also joined by Daniel Smith, who is a postdoctoral researcher at Mazel Lab at the University of Arizona. Uh, he'll present his work towards the finding a unified framework for modeling the interference, uh, modeling interference and exploitative competition, sorry, drawing from classical ecological and game theory models. We're very grateful to our speakers for accepting our invitation to this event, and we're excited to hear from them about their work and how computational analyses using Wolfram Language fit into their research. Uh, each speaker will present for around 25 minutes, and we'll have 20 mi uh, 10 minutes in between present presentations for audience questions. So now with all of that out of the way, um, without further wait, please join me in extending a warm virtual welcome to our first speaker, Jonas Denk. Jonas, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Phileas. Um, also, thanks everyone for the uh, for your time and your interest. Uh, and most of all, thanks to the to the Wolfram team for organizing this uh, very nice event and for this opportunity also uh, to talk a little bit about our research on mutualism in meta communities. And that's actually some uh, work that um, we were doing. Uh, uh, Oscar Halacek and me. Together we're doing uh, towards the end of my postdoc there at UC Berkeley, and uh, I've also been able to publish this uh, quite recently, actually in PLOS uh, Computational Biology. All right, um, just to give you a short motivation and uh, introduction into like, that you have some feeling about mutualism, let me just jump right into uh, some mutualism in micro uh, microbial ecosystems and especially microbial ecosystems systems because that's also something that I've been working on uh, in the lab and that uh, has a lot of very instructive examples uh, of different interactions and also mutualism. So maybe one uh, example uh, like the most the most studied or the the widest spread uh, phenomena of uh, mutualism maybe is a cross feeding where uh, in a certain community, some, some species, they take up some nutrients and um, while they digest these nutrients, they create, create some, um, uh, so in, during their metabolic pathway, they create some byproducts and these um, released metabolites can then, uh, for instance, be taken up by other uh, species. So other species highly benefit uh, from, from their presence. And it has been shown, like in this study, that for instance, if you only provide one resource, like glucose, to to a community, um, um, for instance, that consists of of different bacteria that are isolated from soil or water or plants, that's very widespread uh, phenomenology. You can see very general uh, cross feeding patterns uh, between the different species. Another example that I found very uh, nice uh, that leads to mutualism, uh, including within a population, is the breakdown of carbon sources. And here's a little sketch how this works, uh, uh, taken from this publication from uh, Ratzke et al. And uh, uh, they study, for instance, uh, Bacillus subtilis um, grown on starch. And on starch, it's actually not really able to grow very well. Um, however, it can release some enzyme amylase, which breaks down starch into more digestible glucose oligomers, so um, that the cell, but also every other cell in the in that um, in that uh, population can really benefit from that broken down sugar. So um, uh, that's a very very also nice nice way of mutualism that also doesn't only occur here in Bacillus subtilis, but in many other. Uh, bacterial populations such as budding yeast. And with that, I also want to come to a very extreme case of mutualism, namely when mutualism becomes obligate. So meaning that species don't only benefit from the presence of other species, but they really rely on their presence. So in terms of the cross-feeding example, you could think of one species that 
for instance, uh, produces some metabolite, some uh, resource that is really essential for another species and without which uh, other species would just go extinct. So they really rely on that uh, first species to produce a metabolite. Another very nice example um, based on the breakdown of sucrose uh, in budding yeast, um, analogous to what I uh, uh, explained you here with, with uh, Spacillus subtilis, um, is uh, where they where they measured this uh, very obligate mutualism and and they showed for instance that um, when you um, look at or when you start out with different bacterial densities of uh, budding yeast so here on the x-axis you can see different densities and then you look at the population size uh, number of cells after 24 hours then you can see that after 24 hours um, if you started out with very low initial densities then actually the density decreases even further and eventually the population will go extinct after a couple of days. Uh, however, when you start out with a population size, size which is larger than here, this, this uh, red triangle, then you actually, the population can grow and it grows uh, eventually up to some, some um, stable fixed point here, some carrying capacity. And this phenomenology is very, well known as a strong allee effect in um, ecology, also ecological physics, um, where you have this uh, allee threshold here that the population has to overcome in order to avoid extinction, or you have this bi-stability between extinction for very low initial densities and some finite carrying capacity for uh, uh, initial densities beyond this um, allee threshold. Uh, why is that so interesting? That's uh, especially interesting uh, because it has been used uh, to explain uh, very, um, very dramatic uh, switches, abrupt transitions in a plethora of uh, ecological systems. So in this, in this experimental setup, for instance, when they changed the dilution factor the, here on the x-axis, they did the same thing, but uh, they, they did the same measurement, but for different dilution factors. And you can see that if you increase the dilution factor beyond a certain point here, suddenly the population will no longer be feasible and it will just go extinct after a couple of days. Um, and this is also often related to, um, um, to a tipping point. So you have this very abrupt transition. And that's something that has drawn a lot of attention, obviously, from a theoretical perspective. Also, it's very interesting to study uh, like bi-stability in, in the growth dynamics of um, populations or communities. Um, and also, uh, that which is actually the, the focus here on, in, my, in my talk, uh, on meta-communities. So communities where there's some spatial structure. So has been studied in a lot of different contexts. Um, however, here I want to start actually out at, a, at the opposite standpoint, uh, at the opposite uh, starting point, and I want to ask the question, um, imagine there's no interaction at all between all the species. And now I just slightly turn on some, some mutualism. So there's like no obligation to, 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 co uh, to interact with each other. There's like no uh, very strong mutualism, but very slight mutualism. And then the question that we had is, um, do these weak uh, facultative mutualistic interactions even affect a meta com community, so a community which is structured into different spatial regions. And if if uh, yes, then how? What's the effect? Um, and of course, yes. Uh, the answer is yes, because otherwise that talk would be kind of over already, or um, more boring than it is, hopefully. <laughs> so to address this question, we um, based our study here on this uh, stochastic differential equation which describes the dynamics of the population um, size, so the abundance of individuals of some species i on a certain patch p. And here the first term um, simply denotes the growth uh, of the species with a certain growth rate r uh, up to a carrying capacity k and the mutualistic interactions, which are here set equal between all species uh, to some interaction strength alpha. So every species interacts with all the other species with some interaction strength alpha. Obviously, very simplistic model, but uh, let's start out with this uh, very simplistic but mathematically feasible model. 
And if you look at this first term here, this first part of the equation, that's just the dynamics uh, of a well-mixed population. And if you, uh, or I hope you, you can convince yourself that this is like, there's nothing special going on in terms of some mutual, uh, in terms of bi-stability, allay effects or anything. According to this equation, every single species would simply um, perform logistic growth like um, behavior and just grow to some, some um, population size and star here which is increased by mutualistic interactions, but there's no uh, special um, allay effect or, or anything involved already. Uh, in addition, we also wanted to include some um, meta communities, so coupling between patches. And we used the, again, we used the most, uh, um, like the most feasible um, way and um, a very simplistic view of uh, dispersal where uh, with a rate uh, lambda um, individuals should just hop off some some patch and then kind of are distributed in a in a, a reservoir between all the different patches equally uniformly um, and kind of immigrate again to a, to a different patch and in addition we also included demographic noise taking into account uh, stochastic birth and death death processes um, of the uh, of growth of the system all right, um, first, um, to give you some feeling about uh, the results or like the, the solutions of this equation, we just did some numeric simulations. So just a uh, Euler forward scheme of this, this simulation here for only one species. So there's no mutualism, it's just single, one single species on many different uh, patches. And we look at the dynamics. And we can see by uh, changing the dispersal rate here and looking at the uh, average abundance of the species of the population, we see that uh, the species will go extinct by stochastic extinctions if the dispersal rate is low. However, beyond a certain dispersal rate here, uh, lambda c, the uh, species is the population is uh, able to uh, grow and uh, reaches a finite population size. Um, and this is done uh, just starting at some small initial population size, uh, like let's say around here, for instance. Now let's switch on some mutualism. So just let's increase the number of species to 75, for instance, and do the same um, simulations again. And now again, we see that um, here at Lambda C, something interesting is happening. Suddenly the population size reaches finite values. However, we see this like very sudden jump. And uh, I think for many of you, this might be a really a telltale sign of some uh, bi-stability or like some uh, uh, subcritical, subcritical behavior uh, or hysteresis and so on. And uh, so to, to check bi-stability or the dependence of the initial populations, in other words, we also looked at uh, the same simulations again, starting now at much larger initial populations, so somewhere around here. And indeed, um, when we did these simulations, we saw that there is like this regime of bistability below lambda c, where depending on the initial uh, population size, we find either a stochastic extinction or some finite population size. And this is uh, reminiscent or like this hopefully reminds you of this uh, tipping point we, we talked about at the beginning, where just a small a slight change in dispersal rate would immediately lead to a, like extinction, a very sudden shift in population size. This becomes even more um, uh, clear or apparent in this uh, when I increase the number of species even further, for instance, to 100 species interacting mutualistically. So um, we also wanted to get some insights into the uh, precise uh, shape of this bifurcation here and also get some analytical results. So for this, we heavily uh, used also Mathematica um, and uh, we um, employed a mean field approach here. And just in short, uh, what we did is we uh, substituted all the, the sums over um, populations um, on different patches or in different as uh, of different species. So all these averages here, we just uh, replace them by some average parameter um, n hat 
And this n hat, we just can treat, or let's just treat it as a, as a further parameter of our system. And then we can write down this whole equation here as just the uh, dynamics of a single population um, with uh, here some force. We can write this as some gradient of a potential plus some um, a noise uh, term. And that um, can actually be brought into um, some uh, Gibbs measure. This can be brought into some probability distribution now for the population size, which is still a function of all the parameters now, including also this uh, mean field parameter n hat. And now um, this is still something we can just write down, but now we can also use the fact, so we, we don't have any expression still for, for n hat, but we can use the, the fact that this uh, n hat actually has to be um, the real mean of the population size uh, when taken the mean uh, with respect to this probability uh, distribution here. And um, to take this mean, um, we, first of all, we have to normalize this probability distribution, which is something uh, that uh, we obviously couldn't do by hand. So that's something where we used Mathematica um, to just integrate this over the whole space. And then also in order to um, calculate uh, the mean of the population size. And then in the end, we want to find uh, the situation where really the mean, the statistical mean is equal to this um, mean field parameter. And again, using Mathematica, you can simply uh, find the, the, the points or the parameter regimes or values where this is the case, uh, for instance, by using some, some contour plot function. And uh, here, I show you the result. So here you can see these lines. And these lines are nothing but uh, mathematical results for uh, the contour plot at the value where this is zero. And uh, here the dashed lines, they uh, indicate the unstable fixed point of, um, of, of, my, of my mean of the population size and the, the others, uh, the stable fixed point. And I can see that this uh, agrees very nicely. And I can also see now this uh, unstable manifold here. So, um, in total, we found that uh, dispersal can really mitigate uh, stochastic extinction. So we found that there's like this critical uh, dispersal rate uh, um, beyond which uh, species populations can survive. But we also found that even below this critical um, dispersal rate, species can survive if there are mutualistic interactions and they survive in this regime here of bistability. And um, um, here, um, which is uh, flanked by this tipping point to, on the left. All right, and this is basically the main, the basic um, result of, of this whole study. So that's um, really, we didn't put in any strong allay effect from the beginning, but we saw that in the end, um, there's like this, this uh, pretty uh, striking uh, allay, strong allay effect um, in terms of this meta community that you, really depending on where you start at your, um, in your experiment, you will, um, uh, where you start in your simulations, you will either end up here at a finite population size or at zero. Right. And um, what I, uh, all, the, all the things I want to mention now in the, in the next uh, couple of minutes, are actually direct consequences or they are uh, very nice uh, generalizations uh, actually of this, um, system. And the first thing I want to talk about is the impact or the applicability of this um, uh, tipping points um, on meta communities with more complex interactions. And this, after that, a uh, nice analogy to meta communities where not the, the growth of a species of a population depends on the, dis, uh, depends on the presence of other species, but the dispersal depends on the presence of other species. So let me start with this uh, first generalization here. And um, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, we looked at a very simplistic model where all species interact in the same way with some alpha. Now we released, uh, we relieve a little bit this uh, constriction and we looked at um, a scenario where there are every species has all the species have different interaction parameters, alpha i, j, between species i and j. 
And as a first step, we still draw these um, interaction parameters from some um, normal distribution centered around alpha with some um, standard deviation sigma. And to make uh, for, for some uh, dramatic purpose, we, we even choose like alpha now negative. So the mean interaction is negative, meaning that on average species uh, compete with each other. However, since there's some variance, uh, we, we uh, also have some uh, interaction which have positive signs or which have like some mutualistic interaction um, in, our, in our community. And again, we do the same simulations for different dispersal rates uh, and seeing, uh, starting at uh, small and large population sizes, we really see again this by stability below some, um, below, below this um, dispersal rate lambda C. And we don't only see this like for one single um, realization of interaction parameters, but for, for different sets. So it's uh, really, um, that doesn't only depend on that specific draw of my, my simulation. So also here in these random interaction systems with random interactions, I also see the same phenomenology of these tipping points below uh, lambda C and this bi-stability uh, region here. Um, just to make sure that this is not also like an artifact of this uh, variation between alphas, but this is really like a result of the or consequence of the mutualism, we also measured the mean interactions of all the surviving species. The mean interactions of all the surviving species um, is just like the mean over all the alpha IJs, so for all the interaction parameters, um, of one species um, times the, the population size of, of the species it's interacting with. And uh, so this is kind of the, the interaction that one species is experiences, experiencing in the, in the community of survivors. And we can plot the distribution of, of um, these, these mean interactions um, within all the surviving species after our population, uh, after our simulation, sorry. And uh, for instance, here for, for um, dispersal rates below uh, lambda C, so in this by stability regime, you really see that every single um, mean interaction is positive. So every single surviving species has on average positive um, experiences, on average positive interactions from the community. Only if I increase now the um, increase the uh, dispersal rate beyond this critical dispersal rate, I will see also that species that experience competition will be able to survive. Right. So this tells me that um, first of all, we also saw these tipping points here, just as before. Just now, we don't have a, a nice uh, analytic uh, solution here um, uh, due to this. Uh, yeah. Um, complication of having different interaction um, strengths. And a uh, more important result now is that really we see that um, it seems that uh, the meta community really selects for uh, communities where every single species is really only experiencing mutualistic interactions. So we have some selection for mutualism um, happening in, in these meta communities. All right, and the uh, last um, couple of minutes, I want to um, talk a little bit about a nice analogy uh, where now instead of, uh, yeah, instead of thinking that uh, the growth of species depends on uh, the density, now we think of dispersal depending on density. And you can see this already in the slides plot. So the, our idea and there are a couple of um, also motivations from, from nature, um, which I don't have time to get into, but you can think of uh, maybe also that, that it's quite reasonable to assume that maybe if, if um, a patch is very crowded by individuals from different species, maybe dispersal is larger, like the urge, so to say, to get away from this patch is larger than the, than the, um, emigrate, the immigration onto that patch. Um, and we wanted to look at this, um, this nice uh, uh, situation 
again with our meta community model. First, what we did is we switched off direct interactions, not to confuse our results with results from direct interactions. And now we extended our model of dispersal by uh, as, um, including here some linear dependence of the dispersal rate, um, which, which grows linearly with the presence of um, the individuals of other species. So the larger populations of other species, the larger the uh, emigration rate of, of a species to a different patch. And uh, I just show you the, the results right away. It's um, pretty interesting that actually we see a very similar phenomenology. So again, in colored uh, for different numbers of species, I'm just going to focus now on this green um, color here for, for 100 species. Again, we see that uh, there's this uh, critical dispersal rate. And below this critical dispersal rate, we see the spy stability regime flanked by some uh, tipping point here. We're already very small uh, variation in the dispersal rate, the base dispersal rate would, would lead to some extinction of the population. All right, um, so this means that um, that uh, also the uh, dispersal that increases, so if, even if uh, we now say that dispersal increases with community density, we, we also see this by stability below lambda c, um, uh, in, including tipping points. Okay, so with this, I just going to come to my uh, conclusion. So first, I showed you this this base, uh, this main result that. Uh, although we didn't start out with any explicit uh, alle effect or obligate mutualism, we really found that even in this case of infinitely, um, infinitesimally uh, weak mutualism, we find these tipping points and by stability. Um, and um, as I said, we wanted to call this maybe because it really occurs due to the meta community structure. Uh, this is some emergent meta community um, wide strong alle effect. We found that this also applies uh, to um, uh, species with more complex, maybe more realistic interactions. And we found uh, this, this is also the case, if not growth, but dispersal depends on, on the um, uh, population density. And from an ecological point of view, I just want to make this last comment. This might also be interesting because we we started out like at, with the, with the assumption that like species they kind of go away from each other so they repel uh, repel each other uh, um, on the different patches uh, with which in the end then leads to a, a phenomenology which is very uh, which resembles like a mutualistic interaction actually on the on the meta community scale. Okay. So with this, I would like to uh, uh, thank uh, all the, the co-workers from the Halacek lab, uh, which has been also changing a lot and is still changing, especially to Oscar, obviously, and um, to, to all of you for your attention. I'm happy to uh, answer any questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you, Jonas, for that, uh, that re really insightful uh, presentation. I, uh, as as we uh, wait for audience audience questions to come in, um, I had a question of my own, which is just in the density independent case, um, how, I mean, do you have to, is it, is it clear what determines the range of bistability below lambda C? And in which case do you say? In, in the independent case. So, so, um, so like I find yeah. that when, when the growth depends on the, on the number of species, on the number of individuals, right, of other species, then I get this, um, so I'm just going to go back to this, um, maybe just here, actually, I just can stay on this conclusion slide. So here, as soon as species are interacting with each other, right, then, I, then I get this by stability. If, if there's no if there's no uh, dependence on the density of other species, so then I don't have any interactions or I don't get any bistability. But here, yeah, the range obviously uh, depends on the strength of mutualistic interactions. So mm -hmm. I can I can either change the number of species interacting with each other, or I could equally change the alpha um, in my system, and then I would also get a 
a larger range of um, okay. yeah of uh, of buy stability. Um, I, so to the audience members, I also want to mention because we have we have a um, about ten minutes for questions before we switch to um, to Daniel's presentation. If you have questions, please do make sure to uh, head to the Q and A section and type them in so that they pop up on our end. Um, and so as they as these trickle in, I'll uh, I'll I'll go through a couple more of my own questions that I was writing down as I was uh, as as uh, Jonas, you were giving these slides these uh, you were going over your slides. Um, you mentioned one one of the consequences of uh, mutualism induced tipping points is that there's an increased sensitivity to per perturbations, which can lead to things like community collapse. Mm -hmm. And um, I was wondering is which, which community, I mean, how many or which communities are typically at risk? Is it that there's uniform, a uniform distribution of risk um, among communities or uh, is the risk usually disproportionately applied to a single community or a pair? Um, yeah. What, yeah, that's what, a, that's what a, kind of pattern do you tend to see? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, so in our study, since all the since uh, all the populations, all the species just have the same growth parameters, um, we 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 see that either the whole community survives or the whole community dies out, right? So we okay. it's always like all, all the species are statistically um, identical. So there's no no path of like different species first dying and then others uh, following or so on. But as soon um, we saw this, for instance, here in this in our results with a different uh, interaction strength, then of course uh, species um, like some species they die out first, and others they will die out uh, later. And as I've um, mentioned, or as I've shown, like in the end, we only see, for instance, in this bi stability regime, only species that have, on average, mutualistic. Uh, interaction and that also like introduces some ranking because first the ones that um that experience competitive interactions will die out and then like the ones that that experience the most mutual like the most as the strongest sorry the strongest mutualistic um interactions they will they are kind of the fittest right in this mm -hmm. inter-community system and we've actually also um, looked at this a little bit more. So, for instance, we've studied the communities that um, that uh, that result that uh, we see at the very end of our simulations here uh, with uh, complex interactions, and we find that the community that um, ends up being the surviving community in these simulations is really the the one community like the that has an average interaction that sets it uh, exactly at the tipping point of the of the community. So we are always like in the end, the community is always like at the edge of surviving. And then as soon as you would like um, have a parameter shift um, again, some species would drop out and so on, but you would always like be at the, at the tipping point of survival kind of, yeah. We have a related question from Daniel. Um, who asks um, how? Okay, in, how 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 spatially heterogeneous the community is? Uh, for example, with regards to beta diversity, once we get stability, um, mm -hmm. for instance, at this at, at, as dispersal tends to infinity, the meta community collapses. How close to uh, that does the critical tipping point occur? Let me just read the question last um so again like in this um in this uh, occasion where we have like mutualism we also uh, don't see any special patterns in our system so okay. we don't see uh, there's there's not like all the all the we can we can derive like um from this from this uh, mean field approach we can derive the probability distribution right as i explained for for uh, for the population uh, size on every single patch, um, but there's no um, characteristic patterns or so um, in in my meta community. All patches have the same uh, population distribution, and that um, follows that 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 also depends on the dispersal rate. But it will always have some some um, 
Gaussian um, contribution, uh, which which all patches, uh, which describes the population side on every patch. Um, so uh, I don't remember the second part with the uh, dispersal going to infinite infinity. Oh. Right, as the dispersal goes to infinity, um, the meta the meta community collapses. How close does that uh, does the critical tipping point? How wait? Uh, yes. How close to that does the critical tipping point occur? Yeah. So in our in our case, if dispersal goes to infinity, then also the um, the meta community like. The way we looked at the meta community, it's actually it consists of a lot of different patches. So if we, so in the analytical uh, um, solution, it goes to infinite, like the number of patches goes to infinity. So also effectively the size of the meta community goes to infinity. So even if we put uh, the dispersal rate to infinity, it will, will not collapse. Uh, there will be the time that it collapses goes to infinity. It, it scales with uh, exponentially with the number of patches. And since we have an infinite number of patches in our um, in our approach, uh, the the community will not collapse when when the dispersal rate goes to infinity. Um, oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Well, the, yeah. Thank you for thank you for that clarification. Um, mm -hmm. One one final question I had just before we uh, we switched to uh, to Daniel's presentation was mm -hmm. about this the role of spatial structure on uh, selection for mutualistic interactions. So um, in your in, in in your research, you were mentioning that uh, as species disperse, they have equal likelihood of going to any other patch. Is that correct? That's yes. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, so. There, I mean, it seems like there's there's sort of um, like the the way that you've structured the model allows you to kind of ignore spatial uh, sp the effect of spatial tru structure to a certain extent. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, right, I'm, I'm I'm curious if you could expand on just the effect of uh, spatial structure on on selection for mutualistic interactions with that in mind in, in the context of your model and um, and beyond. And uh, if you could touch on on that a couple words. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I think that's like a very interesting uh, further, to, um, like a future study, kind of like a next step, a logical next step. That, for instance, looking at a dispersal, which is like, for instance, diffusive diffusive dispersal, or so, right, where you have just mm -hmm. coupling between uh, next neighbors, or so. Um, and there's been a lot of studies, uh, for instance, in, in range expansions, where where they looked at uh, different ways of uh, like different growth dynamics also um even with uh, explicit strong alley effects and this has already been shown to to bring like very uh, new properties to to for instance expanding wave fronts or something like that and i think now uh, looking at also mutualism um in these in these systems uh where you have not like this very simplistic dispersal but like for instance, next next uh, like nearest neighbor interactions. I mean, nearest neighbor dispersal. Um, I, I think I also I also for instance I suspect that there are similar um, similar results. Like for instance, that the waves that emerge are not not uh, pulled anymore, but pushed. Uh, for for those who are familiar with that, but that there are like differences between the way how, for instance, populations propagate uh, through space uh, due to that mutualism. Um, and that also that affects structure, I think, uh, like in, in many different ways, like uh, how how different communities separate uh, or, or how they they propagate yeah through space. Well, uh, Jonas, thank you very much for answering these questions and for your uh, your presentation. I I hope perhaps we'll we'll have some additional questions from the audience at the end of the uh, the end of the event. Mm -hmm. um, in the meantime. Uh, I'd like to pass the stage on to uh, on to Daniel for his presentation on a unified framework for interference and exploitative competition, synthesizing classical ecological and evolutionary game theory models. All right, everyone. So I'm going to be talking about what I think is a relatively simple toy model 
with the goal of bridging several different disparate models that uh, are commonly referenced in community ecology and evolutionary game theory. Um, so first on competition. So competition is ubiquitous in nature. And um, if, you ask, if you ask a lot of ecologists, they'll sort of talk about two main forms of competition, uh, exploitative competition and interference competition, which I'll define. And at the crux of this, paper, this uh, presentation today is about a minimal model, minimal model that integrates these two forms of competition. So first, exploitative competition. So exploitative competition refers to indirect competition uh, between, say, two consumer species um, for a shared uh, mutual resource. And here on the right, you see the most basic depiction of exploitative competition, two consumer species limited by a single resource. And this gives rise to what I think is a classic bread and butter in uh, community ecology, which is called the R-star rule. So for those unfamiliar, um, imagine first this very simple um, one consumer, one resource uh, uh, model. Um, and this is a simulation from a very basic um, uh, ordinary differential equation framework. But what happens is you have the consumer in blue and the resource in red, and it comes to some stable point equilibrium. Um, we refer to the um, equilibrium resource abundance set by the consumer that eats the resource um, or utilizes the resource as its R star. So we have R star one. And this R star value corresponds to several different things, but most importantly, it corresponds to the minimum resource requirement of a consumer species. So if the R star drops anywhere below, um, if, if the resource abundance drops anywhere below um, a consumer's R star, that consumer will decrease in abundance. And one could do this same uh, simulation for, um, say, a second consumer. And so the, the key point is that they have the two consumers have two different R stars. And if you were to have a simulation where, um, or analyze the model where you have uh, both of these consumers in the community competing for the resource, um, uh, on the right, you see what happens. Um, eventually, um, the uh, second consumer, consumer two, drives the resource abundance ultimately to its R star, R star two. That's below the critical threshold of, um, of resource abundance that maintains uh, consumer one. And consumer one is competitively uh, is competitively excluded. This is referred to as the R star rule, and it's um, sort of uh, a basic building block that's in um, at the core of a lot of um, semi mechanistic ecological models um, of competition. Um, okay, so that's exploitative competition. But in nature, there's also interference competitions. Organisms often uh, directly interact via interference, such as uh, pigeons in the park, um, birds, uh, hyenas and cheetahs in the Serengeti. And at least for um, visualization purposes, I'm going to be uh, emphasizing these kinds of behavioral contests for resources. Um, and the classic depiction of this kind of model comes from evolutionary game theory, the so-called hawk-dove game. And in brief, um, uh, the game imagines a population with two competing strategies, um, relatively aggressive hawks and relatively and non-aggressive doves. Um, and the idea is that uh, hawks and doves compete for an implicitly modeled resource. Um, and the game works like this. Um, I'm doing it sort of in loose terms rather than uh, how a game theorist would talk about it. But basically, if um, a hawk runs into a dove in competition for a resource, um, the hawks uh, sort of threatens the dove away um, and gets some benefit B um, for capitalizing on the resource. If a hawk runs into another hawk, they fight for the resource. Um, half of the time you win, half of the time you lose. Um, uh, in, or, and it's imagine that there's some kind of tussle or fight for the resource. Um, and so your average payoff is one half times the benefit um, minus one half um, uh, times uh, one and a half times the cost of fighting or of losing a fight. And so the net payoff is benefit minus cost over two. Um, and if a dove runs into a dove, they either share the resource or one uh, might run away. Um, uh, and uh, But on average, you get the resource half of the time. And the sort of key insight of the hawk-dove game is that uh, you can get coexistence between hawks and doves um, if there is, if the cost of fighting C is greater than the benefit of obtaining the resource B. And so it's 
uh, gives us uh, impressive insight into the nature of uh, how interference might be costly or the necessity of costly interference. Um, but uh, this model is a little bit unsatisfying to ecologists because it doesn't explicitly model the resource. It's implicitly modeled. Um, exploitative competition is not part of the model. And so there's no way to, um, in their separate forms, uh, bridge these ideas with classic um, ecological theory, such as the R-star rule. Um, however, ecologies, ecologists do have some uh, thoughts about interference competition. Um, and I'm going to uh, talk about one of those very briefly as well. Um, and uh, ecologists sometimes talk about the dominance discovery trade-off, or more commonly, the competition colonization trade-off. And the idea is you can get coexistence when species experience a trade-off in their competitive and um, colonization abilities. And so the idea is that we have uh, two, spe say two species, and uh, depicted in blue is what we'll call the um, stronger competitor. And the idea is if it uh, runs into uh, species two um, in brown on a resource like the strawberry, um, it will kick it off um, and uh, then steal the resource. Um, but uh, species two makes its living by having a faster colonization rate. And sort of in this cute cartoon, the idea is that the, the, um, the brown ant can uh, get to the resources more rapidly. Um, and so you sort of have this trade-off between, between, between being able to boot off your competitor and being able to get there first. Um, and within certain parameters, uh, these can, uh, this can maintain coexistence. Um, and so it sort of seems like these different frameworks um, about uh, all of which relate to resource competition and the dynamics of uh, utilization and uh, interactions are sort of begging to be integrated into a single model, a single framework. And so the main goal of this project was to create a relatively simple model that integrates um, all these processes and can delineate the, these processes within a single framework. Um, and then today I'm also going to talk about how um, interference competition changes uh, conclusions about um, things like resource density, R-star, and coexistence, and how um, they affect uh, coexistence and competitive exclusion. Basically, um, how do you, how does co what does coexistence look like in a model that has uh, that fully integrated interference and exploitative competition? So without further ado, I will introduce the model. And I'm depicting this with some deer and some grass, but that's more for visualization. Uh, you can uh, substitute a lot of different uh, ecological scenarios into the model. So the model um, thinks about having some sorts of patches, um, and you can have empty patches. You can have uh, individual consumers that are searching for a resource-rich patch. You have resource-rich patches. Um, you have occupied patches in which a consumer is handling a resource. And you have contested patches in which two consumers are competing for a resource um, um, uh, on the same patch. Um, so they're vying for that uh, limiting resource. Um, and just to give your wrap your head around the dynamics of the model, you have a dynamic of patch renewal rate. So at some rate, empty patches become resource rich. Um, searching consumers um, run into the resource um, uh, um, and then begin to handling it at some search rate A. Uh, you uh, There's a handli handling time tau um, uh, and uh, at rate one over tau, consumers utilize the resource, and reproduction is assumed to be proportional to um, resource um, reproduction. Um, and then finally, if a searching consumer runs into a consumer that is handling a resource, they begin a contest. Um, and then when a contest begins, um, there's a giving up rate beta. Um, uh, and based, for example, in this uh, depiction, each uh, consumer ha um, at rate beta gives up um, what will give up first, and then the remaining uh, consumer um, then wins the patch and starts handling it again. Um, and uh, in the future, I'll be sort of talking about this with two types, when you have a relatively hawkish type that gives up slowly and a relatively dovish type that gives up relatively quickly. And sort of in summary, um, these are described in ordinary differential equations. I'll spare you the actual equations, but you have the searching consumers, handling consumers, um, inter intra type competitions or contests for the patches, inter type um, contests, competitions uh, for the resources, 
and resources that are available. And just as a sanity check, if you were to sort of entirely remove um, uh, infratype and, and intertype competitions from the model, all this collapses back down to the R star rule that we talked about. That's just sort of a sanity check. Um, and at least the way this is framed in the paper is sort of perturbing the model from uh, the classic R star rule. So uh, that's the basis that we wanted to start with. OK, so um, how what does adding interference change about uh, the consumer resources, consumer uh, resource interactions? So um, first, I'm going to talk about uh, the single resource case. You have a um, searching consumer, handling consumer, intratype competitions, and available resources. Um, and how does um, interference competition affect resource use and requirements? So this plot here um, on the x-axis shows the giving up rate, and as a beta um, the giving up rate goes to infinity, the model asymptotically uh, uh, removes interference competition. The y-axis is the uh, e equilibrium resource abundance set by a consumer, um, uh, if you solve for the equilibria. Um, and the, uh, the red um, dashed line shows um, the R star you would get from uh, when there's absolutely no interference competition in the model as beta goes to infinity. And the blue line shows when uh, you have uh, the interference competition as uh, um, as influenced by the giving up rate on the x-axis. Um, and so you sort of get two different R stars that are meaningful in different ways in the model. Um, uh, so the R star E, which I call the exploitative competition R star, or the exploitative R star, is still the minimum resource requirement of a particular consumer. But when you add interference competition, especially if uh, competitions are fierce and long, um, the uh, equilibrium resource abundance set by a consumer is no longer equal to its um, minimum resource requirement. So that's a very important distinction um, when you add interference competition. Um, secondly, um, resource requirements are somewhat modified by the presence of intertype interference in the two-type model. Um, and I'll go through this verbally, and then we'll um, look at some applications of this um, in terms of results. So. Uh, basically, um, when you have only exploitative competition, uh, the resource level has to be greater than its if than its exploitative R star R star e. Um, but resource theft, um, uh, inter which is interference in this model, changes that conclusion. Um, for more hawkish types, um, hawks um, doves handling a resource act like an additional resource that. Um, uh, hawks can utilize. And so there's lots of situations, um, if you play with the model, that a hawk can invade, even if uh, it has, uh, even if the R star level set by the dove is um, lower than that of the exploitative R star of the hawk. Um, and for doves, the opposite is true. Um, hub, hawks can, might steal resources, and so you might fail to invade, uh, a dove might fail to invade a community of hawks even if um, even if the um, resource level set by a hawk is uh, far greater than the um, minimum resource requirement uh, uh, for hawks as described by the R star rule. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I'm going to go through basically how competitive coexistence works um, in the model um, and uh, how things look, uh, basically. How does interference competition change our conclusions about resource density, R star, coexistence, and competitive exclusion? So I'm going to look at two cases. First, um, we're going to assume that each consumer has the um, same traditional R star or the same exploitative R star. So they have the same search rate, same uh, resource use rate. Um, they're basically demographically identical. But they might differ in how quickly they give up. And the idea is that one might be more hawkish and white one might be more dovish. Um, and so this is um, sort of a summary of uh, the results. So here on the x-axis is the giving up rate of the hawk. The y-axis is the giving up rate of the dove. Um, the, fat, the larger it is, um, the faster you give up. Uh, we're only seeing uh, the upper left triangle of this uh, figure because it's symmetrical. And so I'm just uh, subsetting it to. Uh, um, so we have one hawk um, here on the x-axis that um, where uh, B, B H is beta h is always great less than uh, uh, beta d. And sort of um, somewhat interestingly, 
I guess um, you get some region um, where being uh, relatively dovish wins. So the dove wins he, um, in this region, and the hawk is competitively excluded in the brown in that brown region. In the green region, uh, the hawk wins. Um, uh, hawk interference is uh, too um, beneficial relative to the um, benefit of avoiding uh, of, of avoiding contests. And then you get some sort of region of coexistence um, of the type of the two types. And uh, there's some previous work that um, gets at this um, in a slightly different way. But ultimately, the idea is that you have some sort of region of hawkishness and dovishness where um, you can get coexistence of the types. Um, but what I'm really interested in is how this affects um, the equilibrium resource um, abundances of um, equilibrium resource abundances. So in essence, um, this plot on the x-axis and y-axis still show the giving up rates of the hawk and dove. And the z-axis is the ratio of equilibrium abundances set by each consumer, the hawk or dove, um, uh, in the single consumer resource case. And so what I wanted to note is that in the R star rule, it's always the consumer that has um, the consumer with the lower R star always competitively excludes um, the consumer with the higher R star. But um, not only is that not true in this plot, but in fact, the region of co where you get the most coexistence or the region coexistence um, of coexistence is largely filled when there's a very large difference in the equilibrium resource abundance set by each consumer, um, where uh, the, uh, the more red the, uh, uh, the z-axis, uh, the greater the difference in R stars. So that's sort of counterintuitive, at least relative to basic uh, to classic theory. Um, and case two, I'm going to talk about when consumers differ in their exploitative competitive ability. So you might consumers might differ in search rate out a, or they might differ in handling time tau. Um, so for a frame of reference, this is um, like the previous plot, but uh, with uh, both axes filled in, where um, uh, in some regions of parameter space, the more hawkish type is winning. Um, in other regions of parameter space, the more dovish type is winning. And in some regions, you get coexistence. And this is when there's completely identical um, exploitative ability. This plot shows when um, consumers differ in search rate um, but have identical handling time. And uh, there's some subtleties that we'll get at in a moment. But the point is that I want I want to emphasize that uh, it's not actually tremendously different from the case where there's um, identical um, exploitative ability. But if you um, were to look at, if you were to modify um, handling time of the two consumers um, in a way where you have the exact same difference in exploitative competitive ability as um, described as the figure to the left of this, um, so the same exact difference in, our, in terms of their uh, exploitative R star values, which is the classic uh, metric of competitive ability, um, you get widely different results. And the species with um, the lower, um, with the faster handling time in this case, um, tends to competitively dominate uh, this uh, the species with the, f with the slower handling time. And that has to do with um, uh, the dynamics of interference. Put simply, uh, if you're interfering for, or if you're handling resources for a relatively long time, that exposes you to being interfered with more and that results in um, uh, relatively large fitness costs of, uh, of your slower exploitative trait um, handling time. Um, and what I think is maybe um, the most telling case, so in this plot on the right, um, consumer one um, is uh, the superior exploitative competitor um, by a factor of two. So it's R star is half of that of uh, um, consumer two. Um, because it has a faster handling time, or sorry, because it has a faster search rate, so um, uh, A1 is much greater than A2. But by a slight amount, uh, consumer um, two has a slightly a slower, hand, slightly faster handling time. And so by classic R star theory, you would expect type one to win. But because of the interaction between exploitative traits and interference, um, type two dominates because it has a faster handling time. Um, I'm going to skip this slide. Um, so in summary with this so far, um, I just want to emphasize that uh, the equilibrium resource density set by a consumer does not predict competitive outcomes, which is contrary to um, the basic uh, uh, measurements um, in R star um, theory um, and its applications. And 
In fact, neither the exploitative R star, that's the um, R star you would get um, from when there's only interfere, when there's only exploitative competition, or R star I, which is the realized R star when there um, is interference competition, necessarily they don't neither necessarily tell you anything about competitive outcomes. Uh, it's just not necessarily reliable information to uh, um, predict anything about competitive outcomes. Um, and so now um, we get to the more analytical part of uh, the talk, which I'll try to keep brief. But basically, um, and this is where Wolfram came in very handy. Um, uh, the, uh, I derived the invasion criteria and the coexistence cri conditions for the two um, consumers. Um, and basically, if this inequality below is fulfilled, you get coexistence. Um, and I'll just very briefly, there's a couple interesting terms, like this P2 term um, on the far left with the arrow, uh, um, is sort of a metric of how costly it is to be interfered with. Um, this uh, H term, uh, H times uh, gamma, or, um, or is that omega? I think, it, um, anyway, um, the latter two um, arrows are pointing towards uh, the probability that a particular, uh, that consumer of type type two wins a contest times the number of handling consumers. So like you have like metric, you have sort of interpretable metrics of um, the sort of dynamics of interference in these terms. I just wanted to briefly mention that. But anyway, the point is um, more broadly, uh, um, on the far left, you have a term that uh, depicts the effect of interference competition on the invasion of type one. The far right term is the impact of interference on the invasion of type two. And the middle, um, the middle term is uh, a metric of the relative exploitative competitive abilities. So for example, if you completely remove um, interference competition from the model, the left-hand side and the right-hand side uh, um, uh, terms, they all collapse to, what, to unity, to one, and uh, you get the R-star rule. Um, and so what this is, is, why this is interesting is that you can use it to parse out the relative importance of exploitative differences between consumers and how interference affects um, uh, coexistence. Um, for example, um, you might have a scenario where, in this case, um, on the left-hand side, consumer one is competitively excluded, um, as uh, depicted by the sign of the direction of the inequality. Um, and that might be predominantly due because, for, because of uh, the difference in R stars. And so that would be like a case that's emblematic um, or so at least very similar to the R star rule. However, you might get one case a case where one type is, um, and this again, type one is competitively excluded, largely because of the impacts of, say, uh, being interfered with from a more hawkish type, or conversely, um, from a more dovish type. So uh, these are sort of the insights that are commensurate with the classic hawk dove game, where you could, um, in, in this model, you can be in, you could be competitively excluded with excluded because you're a poor uh, exploited competitor or because interference is too costly to you. And without respect to the details, you can parse out um, these effects with this inequality. Um, you can also get coexistence. Um, and this might be um, predominantly due to interference, um, how interference in, impacts the invasion of uh, all the consume, of both consumer types. And, and in that case, um, uh, sort of mathematically, this very much resembles the classic hawk dove game dynamics. Um, conversely, at some area of the parameter space, you might have uh, a situation where one consumer, the more hawkish species, tends to invade predominantly because um, uh, it's able to win contests against the competitor. Whereas the more dovish type that loses contests more likely invades predominantly because it's able to, for example, um, get to patches um, more quickly than the hawk. And so that is um, almost directly uh, and mathematically identical in limiting cases to classic uh, dominance discovery or competition colonization trade-off models. You can actually explicitly make the connection. And finally, you get some interesting little parameter space um, that... Uh, that I'm dubbing a sort of novel coexistence mechanism, which I call the submission discovery trade-off. And you have the situation where the species that is um, an interesting coexistence case where you can have a species that is less likely to win contests, so more dovish, and has poor competitive ability, or poor, poor exploitative competitive ability, competitive ability um, but um, still coexists with the more hawkish type. And that's because the hawkish type is so hawkish that uh, 
that um, gener- that's that it's very costly for the hawk. And so at least I think it's counterintuitive. You can have a species that um, is less likely to win contests and is a poor exploitative competitor, but still tends to, but still can persist. Um, um, and sort of showing uh, these in action, you can uh, take these coexistence and competitive exclusion areas, and you can partition them into, say, areas where the hawk is winning, the dove is winning, or you get um, hawk dove like coexistence. And um, these plots on the right show, uh, on these latter two plots, show when you have exploitative differences. And uh, what I'm just emphasizing is that you can partition these areas um, quantitatively into when the R star rule is operating, when things look like the dominance discovery slash competition colonization trade off, when dynamics most resemble uh, the classic hawk dove game, etc. So, uh, and and what how this is partitioned um, depends very much on the parameter space and say, for example, how species differ in their um, exploitative traits, such as handling time on the right hand side versus a uh, search rate um, in the middle. So I know I'm, I'm running out of time. So I'm just going to uh, conclude briefly that um, R star theory is certainly a part of the puzzle in understanding competition, um, but it doesn't account for interference. And uh, interference sort of messes with the qualitative outcomes that uh, are very uh, that are very elegant, but yet, uh, in this case, um, unsatisfactory um, when you include interference. Um, and so I hope that this uh, is a basis to sort of further integrate ideas from evolutionary game theory and community ecology and uh, sort of build towards a single framework that incorporates um, the essential aspects of resource competition. Um, and so I will uh, end it right there. Um, uh, I have some notes about specifically how Wolfram was useful with Mathetta was useful here, but uh, we can maybe talk about that later. So thanks so much, um, Daniel. Thank you very much for your for your uh, uh, very interesting presentation. I, I was uh, as we as we uh, wait for questions for the from the audience to trickle in. I wanted to ask you. Um, I mean, how I know in in there's plenty of exp of uh, empirical evidence for violations of the R star rule. There's a, there's a, there are a lot of challenges to to the R star rule um, in contemporary ecological research in general. I, I'm I'm curious, do the particular kinds of violations of the R star rule that you find you found in this particular model uh, also come up in uh, empirical results or in observation in field observations? And yeah. So that's yeah. So that's, that's something that I'm working to towards uh, investigating. I think uh, it's a little bit difficult to say um, because it probably depends very much on the tax of interest. So um, the majority of um, studies that uh, are empirically looking at um, the R star rule and to the um, to a large to uh, well a debated extent support the basic uh, assumption of the R star rule are done with very well mixed um, like chemostats or um, uh, and like phytoplankton experiments, things like that, um, where probably a lot of these uh, emergent spatial properties don't uh, maybe don't uh, play out so well. Um, and so, what I'm very interested in doing to look at this, um, and I'm hoping to get some collaborators to do, uh, uh, is to like a first interesting starting step would be to be to compare the um, R star you would get um, from purely exploitative traits. So you could say measure the search rate. Um, handling time, uh, et cetera, of um, consumers. And then you could compare that to like the equilibrium abundance of the resource set by the population. And so like that would be sort of like like strong evidence for some kind of interference or population um, pop density dependent interactions uh, playing a role in the R star violation. Like uh, the challenge of doing it in the field, of course, is that there's many, many reasons why um, um, an R star might right. not uh, be reflected in uh, the precise way that uh, like Tillman's uh, original work thought. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm hoping some uh, carefully manipulated experiments might uh, be a good direction. Right. And uh, of course, there's also the, just the, the challenge of uh, in 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 a you know in the field the challenge of actually sampling an ecosystem properly so that you're able to um, to identify uh, occurrences of our star or uh, violations of our stars that's another another question 
Yeah, actually, yeah, I we feel like a... the violations of R star are like a subfield within ecology almost. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, we we have a so one one question from Jonas, uh, who asks how many species could coexist on a single resource? Is it two? Because uh, there's one that's the better consumer and one that's the better interferer. Um, and then this, the follow-up question, uh, could I get to a situation with more species coexisting with different levels of interference or consumption, maybe with spatial structure? Yeah, so uh, you can definitely get more than two with this model. Um, there's some sort of fine tuning of exactly how um, uh, the parameter space might work with multiple, uh, with more than two species. Um, but uh, yeah, like for example, um, and this is not part of this, uh, the paper that this is attached to, but um, I've like sort of done simulations with an adaptive dynamics framework where you're sort of trying to see if you can get to multiple types um, uh, mm -hmm. evolving, and you can you can get uh, you can get branching points where you have at least more than two. Like I've I think uh, depending on the assumptions, it gets somewhat limited. Um, in the same way that um, um, perhaps similar to classic competition colonization trade-off models, like. Um, because like a, a limiting case of this model is precisely the competition colonization trade-off. Um, if you make, uh, if you make certain assumptions, um, and like how many species you get depends on, um, sort of how like stepwise the function is of who wins particular contests. Um, and so in principle, you could, uh, you can sort of torture this model where it, um, sort of gives you the, in something close to the um, infinite number of uh, species that uh, can coexist in like uh, Tillman's uh, paper, for example, in that, I think it's a 1994 paper in ecology. Um, but, and, uh, but I exactly, uh, but uh, so yes, uh, you can definitely get more than two. And um, it is certainly to do with um, that explicit spatial structure of how um, competition occurs. Um, well, so, I mean, related to that, I was wondering how, um, I mean, have you tried uh, extending the model to multiple different types? And I noticed that there was no distinction between types and species. So you can have uh, that when when uh, multiple individuals are in the same patch and they're competing for a resource, uh, we don't we're not keeping track of where of of, uh, of whether they're of different species or whether they're of the same. So I I'm curious whether you're you've noticed significantly different behaviors in your model when it's extended to more than two types that are competing against one another. Um, so um, yeah, there's a couple of different things in there. And like, maybe I should uh, preface this with a like caveat about the very specific assumption of this model where, um, and I think you were getting at this, um, you have like this beta parameter of giving up rates and like for one type or one species in this, in the results I presented, you sort of give up at the same rate, whether you're competing uh, against a, a con specific or a hetero specific. Um, I, there's a version of the model where you break that assumption um, and it's a lot more complicated and you can get things like priority effects um, and things like that. So, um, and that gets even more complex when you have um, multiple types, like in a way, like uh, you, um, you can kind of embed, even though it's a little bit different from this, but it's a little bit like embedding a certain kind of a um, Lotko Volterra competition framework within the model where you have, you might have like different kinds of interactions, different kinds of competitive interaction strengths between um, different types um, that occur at contests. And so like, I think a lot of the complex dynamics that might emerge in um, a generalized Lotko Volterra, although subsetted with it probably only being um, negative interactions probably um, could emerge in um, if you're if you're willing to um, tweak around the parameter space here. Um, right. I, I can see how it. I mean, it would be that possibly fairly. I'm sure there's, there's all sorts of caveats and additional assumptions that would come into play. But it it seems like it would be fairly straightforward to set uh, to to modify the model so that the there's a single beta value per type to type uh, interaction or per type to type and species uh, interaction so that you have um, you have you can then you can then generalize the model for multiple different types of uh, um, I guess beta values depending on the interactions between different species um, and but then of course it becomes very you have this combinatorial explosion of possibilities and it becomes yeah. a lot more complicated 
Yeah, to... but that's actually precisely something that I'm doing. Uh, and like what I'm actually particularly interested in this um, is extending this to questions around um, niche evol um, like niche evolution and character displacement. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of um, models these days that um, are thinking about this and the tool, the framework they're using is something like an extension of uh, uh, MacArthur's consumer resource model, which um, to the unfamiliar, it's a particular kind of consumer resource model where um, you have like say two consumers and um, uh, competing over like a large swath of resources and you'd make a certain kind of time scale separation assumption. And then that um, sort of devolves into what uh, a lockable Terra competition like model mm -hmm. and like usually what, and then that's applied to with an evolutionary model, either an adaptive dynamics model or a quantitative genetics model slapped on top of it. And you kind of like can simulate the evolution of like uh, the evolution of a trait, like um, uh, like beak size. And the idea is that like you have a trait that's evolving that affects the attack rate of a particular consumer on uh, the swath of resources. And the idea is like, uh, do they sort of evolve to like different stable, do like two consumers evolve to do two different stable niches. Um, one thing that I think is interesting is that um, uh, those are like always thinking about something like Darwin's finches. And so it's like thinking about the evolution of beak size. Um, uh, but interest, but it always only um, uh, like usually only attack rate per se is evolved where like mechanistically you would think something like uh, how, how quickly you handle a seed um, probably depends on your beak size rather than how quickly you can sort of get fly over to it. Um, and, and because handling time inter, um, interacts so much with uh, interference, I'm wondering uh, how like um, having these kinds of different, um, different species interaction of like who tends to interfere with who and how um, niche evolution of handling uh, of resources sort of uh, might change our intuitions about how things like character displacement and niche evolution work. I hope that makes sense. It's kind of a lot at once. Um, uh. This is it's really interesting. And thank you for thank you for uh, diving into it. Um, I, I have a question from uh, from Rob Nachbar, who from from Bob Nachbar, who um, which is a good segue, I think, into the discussion section and sort of uh, the maybe some, some closing discussion around this, uh, this event. So uh, Bob asks, are there examples of real world data to which these models have been applied and parameters deduced? And I think I want to extend this question, uh, not just to, to you, Daniel, but also to Jonas. Yeah, I can go through uh, first. Yeah. And the unfortunate example is uh, no with a caveat, like there's parts of this parameters there's parts of um uh within this framework where there's lots of experimental um investigations say related to our star there's lots of um investigations looking to look at looking to see if things like competition colonization trade-offs so like trade-offs between exploitative ability and the ability of a particular species to win contests um for example in ants um uh those have been measured and done, but um, I think, uh, but like what I'm really interested in, which is sort of how resource density changes with interference and those emergent properties, those that there hasn't been much work in. And I think the reason, at least part of it is because there hasn't been the theory to um, uh, to, to motivate it. So my, my hope is at least maybe, maybe someone else, maybe myself and some uh, experimental collaborators can uh, do some uh, work in that um, domain. Yeah. Um, yeah. Regarding regarding my study, I think it's also with the um, mutualism. I mean, it has been studied a lot, uh, but mostly like the the, the examples where I'm aware of, like mostly in the lab in in well mixed systems. And and then as I as I discussed um, at the beginning, they've drawn like a lot of uh, attention to these to these uh, allele effects. So like very strong. Um, tipping points or that are already explicit in the model but it's certainly interesting to to see uh, how this applies to meta communities and there's not a um, i haven't really come across a lot of there are a lot of studies obviously uh, on ecological systems with, which are meta communities um, like grassland studies um, or such but uh, in these studies i haven't uh, 
they they rather like uh, focused on more comp com competition or like uh, resource depletion. Um, they are like probably more with with uh, questions in mind that uh, Daniel was also addressing. Uh, but that would I mean would be really nice to to look at for instance cross feeding um, communities and see how how mutualism can can change their behaviors in in a meta community. Um, yeah. There, there have been a lot of like there's there's some interesting um, examples where, where dispersal really depends on density, uh, like locusts that that suddenly change switch their their states and um, go from very isolated locusts, for instance, to to swarms um, because they feel like some some crowding, and that uh, also allows them to disperse and find new sources of um, food, for instance, which is. Uh, then again, essential for for their growth and survival. But um, yeah, I think it's uh, since we are starting out at a toy model and simplistic model, the idea is uh, rather to get this general insight and then maybe uh, see if if this is uh, resembles some some actual um, um, experimental ecological system. Thank you. Um, you, you both had a chance a little bit to, to get into this, but I want to give you an opportunity to really to expand a little bit on um, what uh, follow up research or future questions you'd like to see answered in relationship to in relation to the work that you've presented today. Um, maybe Jonas, you could start. Um, yeah, I mean, as I said, I, said I, I would like to draw more attention to also like systems where like from a from an experimental point of view, I would like to draw more attention maybe to systems where interactions are also only very weak, maybe and start um, uh, like look at look at systems um, and where to, to see like how how only weak interactions maybe already like uh, influence the meta community or ecosystem. Um, and that's also something uh, from a, from a theoretical point of view. Also, like most most of the current research which is done on on ecological systems um, uh, focus on on like very very complex like um, models. For instance, like there's one one branch of models, right? Which um, starting with with um, approaches by Robert May, uh, it's like very popular to assume, for instance, very random interactions between species and then uh, ask like how strong can interactions be, how different can interactions be in order to, to make the system collapse or in order to, to trigger some speci specific behavior. But I'm a little bit advocating for like models where you, where you start out with uh, with very uh, simplified models, and then um, really try to try to um, yeah get insights into like these basic um, results. So I, I think there's a lot still um, which we can do, like from a theoretical point of view, in like understanding how community structures emerge, but more from a bottom bottom up approach um, as opposed to like um, top down approaches. Yeah, and then um, coming from my from my research as next steps, also I think uh, going from bottom up, obviously, then you can extend also to more complex systems. And I could uh, imagine there are like a lot of a lot of uh, interesting new results. Also, like I think that's something that Daniel is also uh, touches upon Daniel's work, where you include uh, resource. Um, consumption, consumer resource models with a Lotka Volterra type interactions. And you suddenly see like very fascinating dynamics, like chaotic dynamics and stuff like that, which uh, totally breaks any, any R star rule or like any um, consumer resource rule, which you, which you all get in equilibrium. So I think it's really cool to also think of systems where you could uh, trigger some non-equilibrium dynamics and uh, like, sorry, it's not a non-equilibrium dynamics, but some dynamics, which is not st a steady state. So not, it doesn't only reach a steady state, but really like uh, has some, some intrinsic dynamics and then has like suddenly very different phenomenology as opposed to these, um, 
systems, basic systems that always uh, think of uh, steady states. So that's from a theory, a theory perspective, I think something very uh, hot at the moment, at least in my, my field of research. Yeah, shall I? Um, or shall I, I um, one thing I was actually, can I ask a quick follow up uh, thing that I was yes, uh, wanting there. to um, uh, bug Jonas about? So, like, I know there's like a lot of really interesting work in the mutualism literature about like the structure and things like the nestedness of mutualistic interna interactions, like, um, like sort of in con maybe this is what you're thinking as well, but sort of in contrast to like uh, some uh, drawing uh, alpha coefficients from uh, um, a random distribution, um, uh, like, or like your approach with this, like, I could see it as like, some, sometimes this is approach, approached from the sense of, I start with a random distribution and do I get a pattern that looks like uh, natural communities and the structure of mutualisms. Uh, but like, obviously in nature, um, like there are some species that have like very, very strong mutualistic interactions and some that have very, very weak. So I was wondering just how you were thinking about um, trying to get at um, like, adding some kinds of specified structures to um, the interactions in the model, like uh, which of... Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's also something that we're, we've are we been working on uh, in the end, uh, not only with mutualistic interactions, but like combining mutualistic with competitive interactions, right? And then really seeing uh, if we can kind of understand, um, for instance, the emergence of different groups um, or like by stability, uh, just by using maybe not like a random, uh, a huge, uh, very complex, large ecosystem, but like only, only uh, four or so species, and then uh, like see when do species, like I mean, there are clear rules when species exclude each other, right? There are clear rules when species help each other. So can we also um, somehow understand? Uh, can we build up a community from scratch? Um, where we already can just from the interaction coefficients, where we already can say which group will, will exist in the end. And at the moment, it's mostly done like a, a posteriori, right? That you can talk about the distributions um, and so on. But it would be nice to really understand like the exact um, um, requirements uh, you have to put into these like in a very in the most simplistic model in order to get a certain community mm -hmm. like yeah. a sort of like community assembly yeah exactly also community sort of assembly. Um, that's yeah daniel how about you what if what are some follow-ups that you would be um interested or that you you uh, be curious to see mm -hmm. extended yeah, from well, your research um yeah, this is something I'll harp on again uh, that I was discussing before. Um, I'm very, I think, like, to me, the most interesting um, uh, place to take this is, or one of the most interesting places to take this is think, asking evolutionary questions about things like uh, character displacement and applying interference, where uh, we've classically, I think, only thought about exploitative competition. Um, and there's like a swath of models that uh, I'm trying to uh, integrate this framework into. Um, uh, although some of the elegant simplicity is lost. Um, one other thing, I, there, there's some questions about data sets, and I was um, remembering a couple things. Um, so there's some interesting work by a group at UCLA led by uh, Dr. Greg Grether, who um, does some interesting empirical studies of birds and um, uh, what he, I think what he coined like antagonistic uh, character displacement. I probably, I'm, I may have butchered uh, the acronym, the, but uh, there's some evidence. Um, it, it's thinking about like how interference um, leads to phenotypic change in bird, uh, primarily in bird species. And so there might be some kind of uh, um, way to take these, the models I'm talking about and apply them to those evolutionary questions. Um, there's also, I became aware of this sort of citizen science data set that uh, has tracked bird-bird um, interference at bird houses uh, in the United States. Uh, I don't know exactly the character, all the characteristics of the data, but um, you can sort of try to get at these kinds of uh, um, competitive uh, interference competition interactions over a resource. Um, and uh, I thought it might be a cute way to try to apply some of the 
some of the ideas of my model. Um, uh, I, I don't know if it'll work, but uh, I, I thought it would be a fun, uh, might be a fun project at some point. Um, and uh, uh, more, de uh, more generally, um, I'm really interested in, ex uh, like, or in a more substantive sense, I want to extend this model to um, include um, maybe more, certainly more than two consumer species, as we talked about, and also multiple resource species, um, which um, I think like a lot of classical eco ecological models consider might consider two consumers and like a large swath of resources, and that's like the that's where the niche um, differentiation classically occurs. And so I'm very intrigued if uh, some of our deep intuitions about um, uh, character displacement and um, niche differentiation that are largely exploitatively um, motivated um, will hold when uh, you add this additional dynamic and mechanistically integrate this dynamic into the model. Um, so that's, uh, that's my most, uh, uh, that's what I'm excited to do most. Um, I think we're we're getting quite close to our time, but I just wanted to uh, ask you a final question, which is just how did both of you come to choose Wolfram Language and, uh, as a tool to use in this research? How, how did you come to use Mathematica? Um, I can start. Um, so I didn't, get, I, I had some slides about this, but I didn't get to them. Uh, uh, basically, like, I think Wolfram is probably the best language um, for um, doing things um, where you want to get some kinds of analytical results, um, certainly um, for symbolic um, uh, mathematics and things like that. Um, and like in particular, in this particular project, um, uh, like the way I derived the invasion criteria um, that I briefly showed um, uh, or the coexistence criteria comes from uh, a very nasty um, determinant of a matrix that I think I never would have been able to solve by hand, but um, uh, with, with Mathematica, like sort of using Mathematica as a helper um, in terms of uh, the algebra and uh, the linear algebra related to it, um, I was able to sort of uh, squish it down into biologically interpretable terms. And I very much doubt I would have been able to do it uh, without it. And also like in terms of, um, I've, al I've also used, uh, used Mathematica for all of the, um, uh, all the figures and things in this, um, uh, uh, in this paper, and it just is very, very convenient for doing things like uh, region plots and things like that, um, as well as, um, uh, it's not here, but I validated all of the um, analytical results with uh, ODE simulations as well, which was also very um, easy to sort of take, um, take the models in Mathematica and um, sort of uh, turn it into a OD system of ODEs. So that was, that was also a very, um, it was very convenient. Um, yeah, I can, I can only agree. I mean, I also for like, most of all, like first uh, to, for, for just, uh, analytical results, like, as I, as I said, like the, some doing, doing most the integrals or for, for stochastic solving a stochastic differential equation, like getting the probability distributions to, um, to norm, uh, to normalize these distributions and then draw some, um, some conclusions about the mean values um like adding lagrange multipliers and and extracting mean values by dif differentiating these these uh, partition sums so to say there was like something that obviously i couldn't have done uh, with by hand or so um like in the past also for the studies i really appreciated mathematica because i've uh, worked a lot in partial differential equations and done a lot of uh, linear stability analysis and there uh, as Daniel mentioned like um, solving determinants of, of huge matrices is very uh, important um, to get uh, all the, the stability diagrams phase diagrams if you if you want and um, yeah that's that's very very neat and uh, also very nicely uh, displayable with with Mathematica and uh, um, yeah, to, to manipulate different parameters on the fly uh, while looking at the results. That's very, uh, yeah, that's that was very helpful. I didn't see that anywhere, any other software. Yeah. Well, 
I just want to thank you both very much once again for agreeing to uh, to present this event. And um, I mean, we're, we've unfortunately reached the, the end of our allotted time, but I, I do hope that we will be able to stay in touch and that, um, and I, and, um, and that, right. And I, I, I'm sure I'll have some additional questions about your work that I'll reach out about uh, shortly. Thank you very much.